project, and I'll be giving uh, most of the presentation today. Let me start with a, um, a request to um, for everybody to mute their uh, microphones so that we minimize the background noise. And then if you do have something to say, then unmute, and that'll be a signal to us that people want to speak up. Um, uh, so uh, I, I will be joined today by two colleagues who are going to help in the presentation, Ben Haley and Ryan Jones. Um, ben, Ryan, and I were all um, formerly employees of the San Francisco consulting firm Energy and Environmental Economics, or E3, at the time that the work we're presenting today was done. Uh, since that time, I'm on long-term leave from E3 to take my role as director of the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project. Uh, and Ben and Ryan have formed their own company called Evolved Energy research, and they are taking the lead in the development of the analytical tools um, that uh, we're using to pursue the kind of research that we'll be discussing today. And indeed, they took the lead on earlier versions of it that produced the results that you see today. Uh, and let me let Ben and Ryan each uh, say a word just so that you'll recognize their voices when they speak up. Ben? Sure. This is uh, this is Ben Haley. And hi, this Ryan. is Ryan Jones. Uh, great to be here. Um, so let me say uh, just a little bit. I think this background was included in in the email traffic of the last day, but just to make sure that everybody's aware of it, you all have uh, two options for viewing and for listening. So you can view the slide deck today and listen to the webinar via, via the webinar channel. You also have the option of directly downloading the slides um, and viewing those on your own computer. Um, and uh, you have the option of listening by phone. And as we progress the slides, uh, I will announce the slide numbers so that people who are um, participating uh, in that way can can um, can follow. Uh, in terms of options for uh, uh, question and answers, um, our goal is to get through a rather lengthy presentation in about 80 minutes and leave uh, another 40 minutes for uh, Q&A at the end, as John's email last night explained. Um, Nonetheless, uh, we do encourage you to raise questions as they come up, but not in oral form, since with about 30 people on the phone, I think that could quickly descend into chaos. So there are, are, are really sort of four avenues for addressing um, uh, questions. The first is to use the chat feature on um, your uh, webinar sidebar, which is the little word circle and you can type in a question. And Ben will be uh, looking at those questions and answering the ones that um, lend themselves to quick answers and highlighting the others for, uh, for later discussion during the Q&A. Um, the second uh, method of sending questions is to send emails to uh, to the three of us who are leading the presentation, Jim, Ryan, and Ben, and this slide shows the email addresses. I think those email addresses are also um, on the uh, email traffic uh, previously. The third will be the Q&A at the end, and I think what we'll do is first take the, the, the written questions that have been um, not addressed earlier on and are queued up, and then uh, assuming that we have time, then we can experiment with uh, with opening the uh, the floor for for verbal communications, um, and then finally, um, uh, I will try. Uh, this will be another bit of an experiment. 
stopping occasionally to see if there are questions. I, I'm, I'm going to attempt to do that around roughly the end of every other um, main section of the presentation. That is, uh, when you see a green um, section heading slide, every other one of those I'm going to attempt to stop for basically a minute to see if there is a sort of urgent question of clarification that needs to be addressed either by uh, a, a member of the audience or by uh, something highlighted by Ben and Ryan. And I invite Ben and Ryan to, uh, since they're operating remotely from me, to, um, to, to raise such questions uh, at, the, at that time uh, in the interstices between sections. So um, uh, the last point I'll make is that, uh, that this will be available as a recording for those uh, either who haven't been in attendance or simply want a uh, recording uh, available as reference. Of course, the slides are already been made available to you uh, via a Dropbox link that I sent out last night. And, uh, and uh, 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 Ryan, do you, can you tell us now how, how the recordings will be made available? Uh, pr probably on our Dropbox link also, Jim, will be the easiest way to do that. But we can All right. certainly send in info after the call. Uh, great. And then, and then finally, as uh, John's email last night indicated, Q&A with regard to the book as opposed to uh, Q&A with regard to the, the research and reports we'll refer to today should be, should be uh, sent to Michael and to John. Um, so with that, uh, uh, with no further ado, um, then uh, let's go to slide um, three. So here are the topics we're going to discuss today. I want to provide some context to this work uh, to discuss briefly why uh, long-term pathways are uh, valuable, um, the research questions and methods um, behind our work, what the main findings were at a high level, uh, to discuss the energy system transition, um, talk about more sectorally detailed results than we have in the main findings, discuss some of the distributional uh, aspects of uh, these findings, and finally, uh, to, to, to share with you our own take on some of the key policy challenges. And of course, many of you are more expert in these areas than we are, but we will go ahead and share uh, what we think are, uh, are are some of the challenges. All right, next slide, slide four, uh, slide five. So the uh, initial uh, sort of motivation for this work was to really, uh, about 10 years ago, chart out the question of whether deep decarbonization consistent with uh, limiting global warming to two degrees C or less is even possible. Uh, and then, uh, then to ask the question, uh, if it's possible, what are the alternative pathways that can lead us to that end? And then finally, how do we navigate along the way? In other words, what are the um, uh, sort of uh, metrics and benchmarks and forks in the road uh, that we might anticipate? Uh, and, and how might we uh, be able to... to um, chart a course through the, through the challenges uh, of this transition. Slide six. So uh, the work had its origins in, uh, in work that we did at E3 for California. Uh, uh, in 2008, uh, we ended a cycle of work for the state agencies on the implementation of California's global warming law, AB 32. That, uh, that looked at the different technical options for achieving the 2020 target for California uh, and what those uh, would cost uh, ratepayers and citizens in the state. And that became a basis of what's referred to as the California uh, Scoping Plan, which is the main sort of uh, policy document that guides the implementation of that law. Uh, at the end of that uh, project, we, we started looking more seriously at the long-term state objective of 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. Uh, and that resulted in 
uh, a paper that came out in Science in 2012 describing different options that California had uh, for achieving this outcome. Uh, that in turn led to uh, the attention of state officials with whom we were already working on shorter term energy and climate goals. And uh, at a meeting at, uh, with the governor that I had, I'm standing to the left of Jerry Brown in that photo, um, uh, he ordered his agencies to officially undertake a long-term study. Uh, and that study became the uh, centerpiece of a multi-agency effort that ultimately uh, was manifest in the governor's executive order from last year uh, that announced a uh, emissions reduction target of 40 percent below 1990 by the year 2030 on the way to the 80 percent by 2050. And so that uh, filled in a, a key gap in that unknown terrain between the short term and the long term. Uh, slide seven. Uh, one reason that I give this uh, context in California is by way of saying that um, this work is informed a little bit by my own experience. Uh, I'm something of a hybrid, and I won't say too much more about myself, but I think this is relevant here. Uh, I, 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 I took my PhD from, from UC Berkeley's Energy and Resources Group. My dissertation advisor was John Holdren, who's now the president of science advisor. Um, I've been a professor. I've published in the academic literature. Uh, and um, uh, my wife is the head of climate science at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. So I have one foot very firmly in academic energy and climate science. But the years of working in the um, in the regulatory utility uh, energy business arena uh, provided a somewhat different perspective on the problem. And I think what you'll see today is the result of that hybrid effort that, that basically looked at the state of the climate policy discussion as it was a few years ago and saw um, sort of very high level scientific findings that essentially uh, charted how many tons uh, you need to reduce by in order to achieve a certain climate outcome. And that led to certain aspirational goals and 80% by 2050 kind of reduction goals, an example of such an aspirational goal. But that, that the counting of tons needs to be complemented by the counting of things, the things being uh, power plants and vehicles and industrial boilers and buildings. And, 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 the, and the description of how those perform from the standpoint of emissions and so forth. And so I think, I think that is what ended up informing the work that we're showing you here today. And one manifestation of that is the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project, which was um, coordinated by the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, uh, uh, which is led by Jeffrey Sachs at Columbia University at the Earth Institute, and by IDRI a counterpart uh, academic think tank at Sciences Po in Paris. Um, and uh, the, the, the DDPP, that's the shorthand project, created bottom-up uh, national blueprints for uh, limiting global warming to 2 degrees C or less. Uh, the work was done by independent research teams from the 16 highest emitting countries, which constitute about three quarters of global CO2 emissions. And uh, those uh, countries are listed on this slide. Um, the, 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 the effort involved was basically that transition from counting tons to counting things uh, and moving from incrementalism to uh, a, a direct uh, confrontation of the question of transformation, which is going to be required in order to mitigate emissions to the level that's necessary to, uh, to keep from going way beyond a 2 degrees C budget. Um, and that led to, uh, in, in last fall, uh, 16 separate country reports uh, uh, that were um, built by these independent research teams maintaining uh, national sense of priorities um, in, in their analysis. In other words, the, the, the economic development, the social development uh, uh, um, priorities of those countries were incorporated into the 
the technical analysis on the emission side. Um, next slide, slide eight. Uh, and I think one of the, the uh, main achievements of the DDPP to date was the insertion into the Paris Agreement of Article 4, Paragraph 19, all parties should strive to formulate and communicate long-term low greenhouse gas emission development strategies. And a critical uh, player in the creation of that is shown in the picture at the bottom right uh, on the front left, uh, a woman with blonde hair and dark glasses. That's Laurence Tubiana. Uh, she's holding hands with Christiana Figueres, the, uh, the head of the UNFCCC. Um, but Laurence was, at the time of the beginning of the DDPP, the director of IDRI, and therefore, along with Jeff Sachs, is one of the co-founders of this effort. And uh, she was pivotal in actually seeing this language included. Uh, next slide. And on to slide 10. Now, why was Laurence and, and, in fact, several allies, including uh, the governments of the United States, um, uh, China, uh, uh, France and so forth, all interested in seeing that there was a, a um, literal provision in the Paris Agreement that countries should undertake um, uh, long-term strategies in addition to their shorter-term um, uh, intended nationally defined contributions, INDCs, the, the Paris commitments that most uh, most of the uh, uh, news reports discussed at the time. Um, and there are several basic reasons. One of them is that if you don't take the long-term perspective, as we discovered in our own work, starting in California, uh, that um, you can end up doing uh, mitigation measures in the near term that are not consistent with deep decarbonization in the long term. Uh, that is to say, you could achieve uh, the same emissions outcome in 2025 or 2030 uh, in a variety of ways, some of which are consistent with, um, with uh, ongoing deep emission reductions and some of which are not so much so because they tend to create infrastructure commitments uh, uh, that, that would make it difficult to result uh, and, and, and even deeper reductions ongoingly. Slide 11. Uh, another reason that it's quite uh, critical to take a long-term view is that it is uh, possible and necessary to anticipate forks in the road. Here are two actual um, sort of observations based on our long-term um, pathways work in California that have become part of the um, sort of uh, policy regulatory agenda. These are questions that are actually actively being pursued. Uh, one of them are the implications of um, uh, low carbon um, light duty uh, vehicle transportation, whether it goes the battery electric vehicle route or the fuel cell vehicle route that obviously has implications for uh, what kind of uh, electricity side infrastructure there is. It's a systemic question. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, the, the, the lower uh, of the rectangles here shows electrification versus low carbon gas and buildings. By taking the long view, uh, you can um, discover uh, that there is a, a, a choice that will eventually be faced in California between uh, pursuing an electrification option in building and pursuing another one that uh, that would involve using uh, low carbon um, uh, decarbonized pipeline gas is the term of art that we we use and so I won't linger on these at this point but just to say uh, long term uh, low carbon planning helps you uh, 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 anticipate forks in the road slide 12. Um, and then finally, uh, this graphic shows an example uh, from the synthesis report all across the 16 uh, participating uh, DDPP uh, countries. On the left-hand column, what you see, I, I, I said a minute ago that this is about uh, adding up stuff, essentially, um, uh, things like 
things like electric, uh, electric generators, um, uh, decarbonized fuels, and alternative vehicles. And those are what the three rows in this graphic show. If you add up the stuff that was required by all of the 16 countries, um, and then apply the price assumptions that they had initially for go it alone policies within their own countries, you end up with the cost curves, basically capital investment cost curves that are on the left-hand column. If instead you assume that there is in fact a global market that is created through collaboration and favorable trade policies and, and, and so forth, uh, and apply a standard learning curve to the cost reduction associated with technological learning and economies of scale, you end up with the um, capital cost curves that are in the right-hand column. And it's a rather dramatic reduction. It's on the order of a factor of two. And this, uh, this, this points out the uh, sort of an, another aspect of the efficacy of long-term uh, low-carbon strategies, that, that it provides a transparent signal to potential collaborators, cooperators, trade partners, uh, uh, and so forth, um, uh, it, that allows the um, discovery of potential uh, benefits um, and also potential problem areas. So these are uh, this is uh, uh, these show a few of the reasons that uh, that long-term um, uh, analysis is is valuable. Uh, next slide, slide 14. So uh, within the uh, umbrella of the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project, there is of course a U.S. team. Um, uh, uh, ben Ryan and I are on that team. Uh, and we produced uh, two reports. The first was a uh, technical report. And I should say uh, collaborators also included um, uh, scholars at UC Berkeley, at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and at Pacific Northwest National Lab. Um, and the, uh, the question basically posed by the, the technical report was, what would it take for the US to achieve uh, an 80% by 2050 goal, uh, and essentially asking, is it technically feasible, what would it cost, and what physical changes are required. The second report published last November uh, we call the policy report, and it explores the policy implications of the findings in the technical report. Slide 15. Uh, and so uh, at a high level, uh, the analysis actually looked at two targets. The first one is the 80% by 2050 target referred to earlier. That's essentially the U.S. Copenhagen target, which was actually 83% below 2005. Those, those two targets are much of a muchness. Um, and then there is a separate energy CO2 emissions target of 1.7 tons per person. And that is a DDPP collectively agreed upon long-term aspirational goal. And it's basically, um, it's basically achieved by um, taking the IPCC's uh, emissions budget for a uh, two-thirds probability of staying within uh, 2 degrees C and dividing it by the, uh, by the uh, World Bank's uh, and UN's population projections for mid-century. And you end up with a 1.7 ton per person budget. And so we, we, we analyzed both of those. Um, we did it with a hybrid modeling approach. Uh, the energy pathways model, which uh, Ben and Ryan are, uh, the, were the developers of and are ongoingly the developers of, was focused on energy system um, uh, emissions. Uh, our colleagues at LBNL and PNNL um, worked with us using the GCAM integrated assessment model to look at non-energy and non-CO2 emissions. And then subsequently, a third-party analysis was done by ICF using the macroeconomic model RIMI to take our economic results and, um, and, look, at, uh, and look at those from a macroeconomic perspective. Uh, we're not going to talk about those today, but I can direct people to 
um, to the report on the uh, macroeconomic analysis. If you're interested, just contact us by email. Slide 16. Um, there there are uh, uh, several constraints to the design of our scenarios that Merritt mentioned. And, and I think one thing I've, I've neglected to say so far is this is not a forecasting exercise. Um, it is not like um, the Department of Energy's National Energy Modeling System, which is used in the development of the Annual Energy Outlook, which is an attempt to forecast what will happen in the future uh, in terms of U.S. energy consumption and energy mix and so forth. This is a backcast. It's starting from the 80% by 2050 goal and asking the question, what needs to be done in order to get there? And um, uh, it has these characteristics. Uh, it assumes infrastructure inertia, and I'll describe in a second how we enforce that assumption. It requires electric reliability. It provides the same level of energy services, that is, everything from, from, from driving to clothes washer cycles, as, as in the EIA's long-term forecast. Um, it, it employs only technologies that are either commercial or near commercial, and, uh, and Ben's uh, way of describing that, which in fact appeared in the New York Times a few months ago, is, is that these are all technologies that uh, I could hand you a hard hat uh, and you could go out and witness an operation in the field somewhere. That there, there, there are things that are far beyond the bench stage. And so near commercial, an example of that, for example, is, uh, is carbon capture and storage, which is uh, in, a, in a pilot stage right now. And finally, there are some environmental limits imposed on it uh, in terms of how much biomass is used, how much hydro is developed, and so forth. Uh, and then at the bottom, you can see what the assumptions are in terms of GDP growth and U.S. population growth. Both of these are the same ones used in the, in the, uh, in the DOE uh, long-term outlook. Slide 17. So uh, the Pathways model uh, is an energy system model uh, with user-defined scenarios. Uh, this is the approach that's needed for, for backcasting and intentionally exploring a different kind of technology outputs. It doesn't uh, optimize based on assumed relative prices of different things, whether they're oil prices or, or, or EVs or, or solar cells. Instead, it, it, uh, it looks at uh, what the cost would be given the cost assumptions, but, but allows you to construct the scenarios in ways that are informative about infrastructure and technology needs. It has many demand and supply sectors. Uh, it's highly granular in that way. It, the the uh, uh, equipment stocks roll over every year according to their uh, economic lifetimes. Um, it is modeled at the level of nine U.S. Census divisions. Uh, the, basically, it has the same level of detail as the National Energy Modeling System. But aside from using that uh, DOE forecast for the term energy service requirements, uh, the, what it does quite differently is it allows you to do this backcasting exercise and understand what changes in performance what changes in rates of technology uptake and so forth, what changes of cost are associated with different low carbon pathways. And finally, it has an electricity dispatch uh, at the level of the three major interconnects in the United States, the East, the West, and, and Texas. Slide 18. Um, GCAM, uh, as I mentioned, was used to model non-energy and non-CO2 emissions. Um, and uh, the, the, the key components of that were biomass production and in, uh, indirect land use change emissions, uh, non-energy and non-CO2 mitigation, and sensitivity to ter terrestrial carbon sinks. Uh, we'll come back uh, to that a little bit later. Next slide. Um, now, I promise to experiment with uh, taking one minute to see if there were any urgent and brief questions of clarification. So let's see how that goes. Let's give this one minute and see if there are any sort of urgent questions so far. And uh, uh, I'll just let people turn on their mics and speak up if they, 
if they want to ask a question. And it'll be first come, first serve. <laughs> Okay, not hearing a question, then uh, I think I will um, I will continue on. All right, on to uh, on to slide twenty. So um, the main finding uh, uh, of our work is that an eighty percent reduction below nineteen levels nineteen ninety levels by twenty fifty is in fact achievable. Uh, this is a uh, a sort of an idealized graphic to give you the idea of what we found. Um, uh, the upper dotted brown line is gross emissions from all sources, uh, energy and otherwise. Um, the purple dotted line at the bottom of this graphic shows the carbon sink with an assumption of uh, being maintained at a certain constant level uh, because it's very difficult to predict what the sink will do, whether it will expand or contract in the future. And then the net emissions line um, uh, is uh, the, the, the net of gross emissions and the sink. And that meets in all of the different scenarios we looked at uh, the 80% goal. Uh, slide 21. Uh, we found that there were a multiple feasible technology pathways to achieve this outcome. Uh, we built four different, quite different scenarios that that are both consistent with the 80% reduction and the 1.7 ton per person target, which with the U.S. population uh, projection um, uh, uh, projects to a 750 million metric tons in 2050 for energy uh, CO2 emissions. The four cases that we built we refer to as the high CCS case, the high nuclear case, the high renewables case, and the mixed case. Um, those, of course, refer to the, um, the main component of the electrical generation mix. But in fact, these cases um, differed in many other ways, uh, that, as you will see uh, as we go along. Uh, not a, they were named according to the generation mix, but in fact, uh, they involve many different uh, kinds of technology approaches in in vehicles and uh, and uh, uh, industry and 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 across the economy essentially. But anyway, with all of those as the um, uh, with all these different scenarios and options, we were able to find ways that achieved the targets. Slide 22. Uh, a, a second main um, finding uh, is that that deep decarbonization cost is affordable, and uh, of course that is a, a somewhat subjective question. But it is uh, it is the fact that we found that the net energy system cost, which is the net cost of uh, of supplying and consuming energy services. Um, uh, which is the net of what additionally is spent, for example, on low carbon technologies uh, over um, sort of reference case, less efficient, more carbon intensive technologies. And also net of what's spent on fuel in the high carbon and low carbon cases. If you compare uh, the low carbon cases to the reference cases, you end up with a net cost on the order of 0.8% of GDP with a with a wide uncertainty range, and this does not include any economic benefits uh, of avoided pollution or or, or or climate damage. This is not a macroeconomic result. This is an energy systems result. Slide 23. Uh, and so one way of summarizing our results at a high level. Uh, is to do it in, in three uh, statements that to some might sound like paradoxes. Uh, with regard to a deeply decarbonized energy system, there it, it's characterized by a big change in the physical energy system and yet little change in the energy services that uh, are required by society and the economy. Second, uh, in a deeply decarbonized energy economy, there's a big change in the uh, 
the direction of flows within that econo economy, but relatively little change in consumer cost. And third, uh, in terms of the macroeconomic effects, that the cost of this transition uh, seems small relative to GDP and yet has significant benefits for macroeconomy. And let me, in the next few slides, illustrate each one of those uh, one of those points, slide 24, shows this is a so-called Sankey diagram of the current energy system. Uh, uh, many of you may be familiar, in case you're not. What you see on the left-hand side of the graphic is um, primary energy inputs to the economy. What you see on the right-hand side uh, are the end uses, which are subsumed in these three uh, uh, Uber categories of buildings, industry, and transportation. In the middle are transformational processes, uh, for example, petroleum refining. And the, the size of the arrows is proportional to uh, the flow of energy to the system. And so uh, what you can see here, if you look at the the bottom three rows, you see the three main fossil fuels. You see that those arrows are very large. That's consistent with the kind of economy we have today. Um, if you forward to slide 25, you see um, a very big change in what the energy system looks like in 2050. This is for one of our four scenarios, the, the mixed case. And what you can see is, if you look at the bottom left-hand rows again, uh, there's much less fossil fuel flowing through the system. Uh, in this case, essentially no coal at all. Uh, there's still some gas, uh, much of it going into electricity generation, uh, a much smaller amount of petroleum. The other thing that's worth pointing out, uh, Ryan, if you'd back up to 24 and then again to 25, uh, look at the blue line, which is electricity. What you see there is that electricity has expanded by a factor of about two. One more time, Ryan, back and forth. So, so you see the shrinking of fossil fuel inputs. You see the expansion of electricity. And you also see the expansion of the non-fossil energy sources. Slide 26. And so even though there is a very substantial change in the profile of the energy system, indeed a transformational change, the energy services uh, relative to current are uh, essentially identical. And as I said, these are uh, basically what the uh, US Department of Energy's long-term forecasts suggest. Um, uh, slide 27. Uh, again, this is another way of showing the big change in energy economy in terms of cumulative net investment uh, on, uh, uh, for each of the four uh, deep decarbonization cases. Um, the black lines are the net investment. Everything above the zero line is a positive net cost, and, the, and below the zero line is negative. And the things that are negative are uh, the foregone conventional uh, vehicles, conventional power plants, and so forth. The above-the-line positive costs are, uh, are the efficient and low-carbon uh, equipment and infrastructure. Slide 28. And uh, in addition to the infrastructure costs, this shows uh, cumulative net fossil fuel spending for the same four cases over time. Uh, and so we are talking about changes in flows in the energy economy of tens of trillions of dollars cumulatively out to 2050, and yet the net change is relatively small. Um, next slide. Uh, and as consumers experiencing it, um, this shows a net household cost of $36 a month, uh, uh, where the, the net cost is essentially similar to that experienced in the economy as a whole. Householders are spending more on equipment costs. They're spending more on very low carbon electricity. They are saving on, uh, on natural gas costs in the home. They're saving on gasoline costs. Uh, and, and it nets out to about uh, $36 uh, per person per month. This does not include the flow through of, um, of increased cost uh, for industrial products but only for household expenses. 
uh, slide 30. Um, and so as a um, uh, percentage of GDP in 2015, the U.S. spent about 7% of GDP on, on, on energy, um, mostly, uh, mostly oil uh, and, and almost entirely fossil supplies. Uh, in, if, you, if you go out to 2050 and look at our deep decarbonization case, given the economic growth forecasts and so forth, even with deep decarbonization, um, the, the cost of, of energy as a percentage of GDP actually drops. Now, of course, that's a lot of crystal ball gazing, uh, but it does show that um, if those uh, uh, sort of assumptions were to hold, um, this is not a uh, deep decarbonization. This, this uh, uh, lens, at least, would not um, suggest a... Um, uh, a sort of impossible level of lift for for society and for the economy. So it's a small uh, net cost relative to GDP on the order of 1%, and then slide 31. Yet the implications for the macroeconomy are pretty uh, significant. Uh, on the left-hand side of this graphic, you see um, a classic uh, figure, um, this one from Kobitz, but it shows um, that uh, the periods of U.S. recession, um, which are indicated by the gray vertical lines, have often been um, triggered by rapid rises in the, um, the cost of energy as a percentage of GDP, not just uh, a, a steady cost level, but a rapid change, which is associated with, with oil price shocks. Um, and while this is... Uh, I think still a, a subject of scholarly discussion. Um, it, the the point that that we want to make is uh, whatever mechanism this might have for affecting the economy. Um, if if you look at the right hand graphic, this shows for uh, the deep decarbonization mixed case scenario that oil consumption in 2050 basically is at the level that it was in 1950, and of course the economy is much larger, and so oil consumption drops to something like half a percent of GDP. That falls below the level, even with price volatility, that might might double that uh, that um, sort of uh, share of national consumption. Uh, that it falls well below historical thresholds of what's sufficient to trigger. Um, recessions in the United States. And so this could be a significant macroeconomic benefit. Next slide. Uh, and on to 33. So uh, we're talking now about what the requirements of this transition are. Um, and so this actually isn't a modeling result. It's just a, an illustrative diagram, but it's one that, that, that people seem to remember. Um, uh, this shows the uh, average lifetimes of some of the most important energy using and uh, energy supply equipment from electric lights down to buildings. And um, uh, the point of this is that um, there, between now and mid-century when we have these ambitious goals uh, that the Paris Agreement refers to, um, there are actually relatively few opportunities, and in, in some cases, maybe only one, uh, in order to uh, make changes in our uh, energy uh, supply and induce infrastructure that are consistent with our long-term pathways. Uh, we, these are not questions that can be put off into far in the future. And referring back to my earlier slide on dead ends, this is exactly uh, what the problem of dead ends uh, is related to. Uh, we, we, what we found in the United States, and this is not true, I think, in China and some other countries where their infrastructure is much more recent on average than ours is. Uh, but in the United States, it's, it's just a, a sort of a, it was a finding, not an expectation of our analysis, that early retirement of existing infrastructure in the United States is not required. You can replace everything on schedule with uh, efficient and low-carbon uh, uh, technologies, but 
you have to do it in a timely fashion. You essentially can't miss an opportunity. If you do that, you will indeed uh, end up either having to do early replacement or not meeting your emissions goals. Slide 34. Uh, another finding uh, of the U.S. work, and in fact of all 16 countries in the DDPP, is that there are three elements in all deep decarbonization approaches uh, required in all cases that could be um, constructed by the different research teams. We call those the three pillars, and they are energy efficiency, um, uh, the decarbonization of electricity, and end-use fuel switching uh, primarily to electric sources, meaning either directly using electricity or using electricity-derived fuels such as hydrogen. And so you can see some metrics on these uh, showing the, the decrease uh, in energy intensity of GDP, um, the, the reduction in emissions intensity of electricity by about 30-fold from current in the United States, and then the the, um, the share of electricity and electric fuels to from its current share up to to over uh, about half of total final energy consumption and so it's an electrified economy with very uh, low carbon electricity that's also very efficient uh, slide 35 um, now how those uh, three pillars are achieved. Now, those are outcomes, of course, energy efficiency, uh, uh, decarbonized electricity, and, 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 and switched fuels are outcomes. But how those are achieved, there's quite a bit of, of optionality. There are many different uh, technological approaches. And our finding was that there are actually five key elements uh, that uh, will end up defining the nature of a low carbon uh, energy system. Uh, those are the electricity mix, um, the, uh, the, the, the magnitude of biomass supply and the way that it is applied, uh, whether uh, uh, carbon capture and storage uh, is available and, and on what scale, um, uh, what kind of fuel switching strategies there are, and then finally, uh, given the electricity mix, different electricity balancing strategies, that is, the ways that we in, ensure that electricity supply and demand are maintained uh, for the reliability of the system. And so in our four scenarios, uh, basically what you can see is uh, different, um, different uh, sort of implementation of these five uh, key elements um, in ways that make sense internally uh, 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 that provides some consistency because not all combinations are, uh, uh, are mutually consistent from a system standpoint. Let me show what that means. Slide 36. So uh, this, yeah. So actually that's a great idea, Ryan. Why don't you run through these four slides quickly and backwards. Um, 36, 37, 38, 39, uh, go backwards. Yeah, 36. Yeah, good. So what uh, what you what you are seeing in these uh, sort of nine part figures? Sorry, am I hearing a question? Just a reminder to mute yourself when you're, uh, when you're not talking. Yeah, Brian, I didn't hear that. I'm sorry. I, I, that was just a reminder for everybody on the call to mute themselves if they're not asking. Okay, questions. thank you. Thanks. All right. Okay, so I'll go on with slide 36. So what this illustrates is the strategy uh, in the high CCS case. Uh, what you see are three columns related to liquid fuels, gas fuels, and electricity, and three rows. The top row is is demand by sector, transport, and industrial. Um, and the middle row is the energy supply mix uh, for each of the liquid, gas, and electric fuels. And then the bottom row, those black lines, are the, um, are the emissions intensities of the, of, the, of the supply in that column. Again, so the emission intensity uh, on average of a gas fuel or electricity or whatever. And so this shows uh, for the high CCS case, for example, if you look at the the middle um, 
uh, row of the right-hand column. So that's the electricity mix. What you see, and you can look at the legends there, is that as we get out toward um, uh, mid-century, the light gray color, which is fossil with CCS, becomes the dominant single form of generation in the electricity supply. And fossil without CCS, which is the dark color on the very bottom, uh, is, is, is greatly reduced to, to a minimal role in the long term. There are also other forms of electricity. There's some renewable and there are some nuclear in the system, but uh, primarily fossil. Another thing that you'll note in the, um, in the middle uh, row and the middle column, the, the natural gas uh, pipeline supply mix shows that the supply mix is still predominantly fossil natural gas with only a, a little bit of, uh, of other uh, kinds of, uh, of gas components, such as the thin green line on, on biogas. Uh, now, the slide 37 shows a high nuclear case. And what you'll see there on the right column uh, middle row is a big, uh, what appears to me to be a pink wedge, which is the, um, the nuclear generation. And that becomes the dominant uh, generation form in that particular um, scenario. Um, and there you, uh, uh, one thing of note here, if you look at the upper right column uh, on the first row, um, you'll see there's a fairly big bar called intermediate. Um, that is to say that on the demand side of electricity, you have industrial uses, you have transportation uses, you have building uses, and you're also using a lot of electricity to produce an intermediate energy carrier, which is basically hydrogen. And so that blue bar there shows up in the middle row left-hand column in the, in the silver wedge that represents hydrogen used for transportation fuel. So this shows sort of the systemic nature and relationship uh, between the supply side, demand side choices according to those five elements I mentioned earlier. Uh, next slide, Ryan. Slide 38 shows the high renewables case. And then you can see that uh, electricity supply is dominated by the large blue um, wedge, which is wind and also also solar. Uh, that is um, that's something that pr probably in the mo uh, in the new um, versions of the analysis that we expect to complete pretty soon may may that proportionality between wind and solar may change because even in the time since we did the analysis, the the the, the decrease in co solar costs um, has somewhat changed that equation. Nonetheless. This is the scenario based on cost as we experienced them at the time. Um, and then I want to point out in the middle row um, and middle column under gas fuels, what you see now is that um, the gas in the pipeline uh, is dominated by um, non-fossil natural gas. The tan on the bottom is still fossil natural gas, but the green is biomass. And in fact, all the biomass resources in this particular scenario uh, uh, are, are dedicated to uh, the production of biogas, which is put into the gas pipeline um, to make a, uh, a lower carbon fuel. Uh, so also uh, is hydrogen and synthetic natural gas another product that's derived from electricity. And then on to uh, slide 39. In this one, you see the mixed case, which has uh, relatively equal proportions of the light gray, which is the fossil with CCS generation. This Here I'm talking about the right-hand column and the middle again, the generation mix. You see fossil CCS, you see nuclear, and you see renewables. Um, that Actually, the renewables are a somewhat larger share, but they're roughly, uh, roughly similar shares. Uh, and you also see in the middle column, uh, middle row, that this is also uh, a pipeline gas supply mix that is highly dominated by, by biogas sources. Um, and on the, um, 
we haven't talked much about the first column on liquid fuels. The basic strategy in liquid fuels is that with um, vehicle, especially light duty vehicle electrification, uh, the first um, consequence of that is simply a great decrease in overall energy requirements, even for um, uh, similar levels of, uh, of, of vehicle use. Um, just because of the greater efficiency of the electric drivetrain, but you also see that there are some um, uh, so there is some hydrogen use in that uh, in that middle um, middle row of the first column uh, uh, related to light duty vehicle use, and most of the residual liquid fuels, as we'll see uh, in, uh, again in a few minutes in more detail, is dedicated to um, transportation uses that are harder to substitute for as we currently understand the technologies uh, such as heavy-duty vehicles, freight, and, uh, and so forth, uh, aviation. Okay, so that shows the, uh, the four sort of transition graphics. If we wanted to look at that same picture simply as a snapshot in the year 2050, you've already seen the Sankey diagram. So what we're going to do here is sort of a, uh, a flipbook style uh, looking through um, through the four cases in the same order, CCS, nuclear, renewable, and mixed, as the transition diagrams that we just saw. And so, Ryan, if you'd go back and forth a couple of times, this should give folks a, a sense of the, the nature of the changes. So mixed, renewable, nuclear, and CCS. And maybe one thing that you can see from this more clearly than than from the previous um, figures is that this is, is the case that's the most similar to uh, the current situation in terms of the, um, the continued um, use of fossil fuels. You see that big gray line for coal, which basically doesn't exist in any other um, scenarios that we have, uh, and also significant amounts of, um, of natural gas in that. Um, and so this is a scenario that's uh, highly contingent on the successful deployment of, of CCS technology and its uh, storage um, uh, capacity and so forth. Um, even I will say, though, that it's not entirely what somebody might consider to be a, um, a drop-in case, although that, that may be how it's discussed in, in some quarters. There's still a great deal of efficiency a, a great deal of use of renewable generation and so forth. Even in the high CCS case, you can't use fossil fuels in all the old applications. There simply isn't enough carbon budget for it. And so um, uh, some, some caution is taken uh, in interpreting what a high CCS case would really mean. It's still a very transformed energy economy. OK, on to um, the next slide, Brian. So 44, uh, 45. So now we're going to drill down into the sectoral uh, results that um, uh, uh, that are more sort of granular representations of what you just saw in the last few slides uh, showing the, the the low carbon transition. So uh, slide 46 on electricity generation. So if you were to go back to um, the um, uh, right-hand column in the middle row of the mixed case uh, figure, uh, you would see exactly what's represented here. The, um, the little uh, colored bars, the vertical colored bars, show the distribution on the demand side in 2014, 2030, and 2050, and then the long wedges show the generation mix. And so, as we discussed in the mixed case, there is some uh, fossil CCS generation, the sort of brownish color, uh, some nuclear, the pinkish color, and then some uh, of the uh, blue-gray and, and, and gold, which are, are the uh, 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 wind and solar. Um, and so that's the supply and demand mix. In the mixed case, uh, slide 47, this shows um, the generation by type across the four cases and in comparison to the reference case. Um, so the, the, the keys are shown uh, uh, in the legend at the bottom, 
uh, the diamonds are the um, emissions intensity for each of these different uh, types of, uh, of generation mixes. And what you can see is across all of these generation mixes, uh, there are uh, very, very steep reductions below the um, intensity for the reference case, which still is largely dominated by fossil fuels. This is the DOE's long-term projection. Uh, the other thing that you'll note from this is because across all of these cases, there is simply a lot more generation in the deep decarbonization cases than there is in the reference case. And that's because even with a lot of energy efficiency, you have added electricity demand by electrifying uh, many of the end uses. And without that, you simply can't achieve uh, an 80% overall reduction. Um, and one, one final point is uh, I made the, the, the point that, that even with CCS, uh, there are many things you have to do um, that are transformational in nature. You'll notice that the emissions intensity in a uh, high CCS case is still um, is still higher than that in the other cases. That means your electricity carries a little more embedded carbon, and it means that you have to do other things uh, elsewhere in the economy uh, to compensate for it. Um, slide 48. Uh, and this shows uh, the same uh, 2050 slice in terms of generating capacity. Now, the, the highest generating capacity is, of course, uh, the renewables case, since um, intermittent renewables have uh, lower capacity factors than do um, uh, the types of generation that currently operate at base load. Um, that does not necessarily mean anything in terms of the overall economics. It's really um, the, uh, the cost of the electricity as produced and it, indeed the system uh, cost that that it is a component of that really matter at the end of the day. But this does show you basically um, across, um, across all scenarios that you need um, substantially more, um, on, on average, about two times the generating capacity build out that, uh, that you would have in the reference case. Um, and again, as a, as a general rule of thumb, the generation level compared to today is on the order of, of 2x uh, uh, what it, uh, from what it is today. Um, slide 49. And then uh, here uh, are another sort of set of, of uh, flip charts, if you will. We won't dwell on these, but let me point what out what they are, and then Ryan can sort of go through the four again. Uh, they're just meant to illustrate um, a few things. So what you see is uh, four, three groups of four bar charts representing the eastern interconnection, Texas, and the western interconnection for a particular case, the high CCS case. And you're getting a decadal look at the, um, the percentage of generation by fuel type in each one of these kinds. And so if you look at the very first one on the, on the, on the left-hand side in the 2010s in the eastern uh, interconnection, you see uh, from top to bottom, dark blue, which is onshore wind, and light blue, which is hydro, and orange, which is nuclear, and then uh, uh, brown, which is conventional gas, and, and sort of dark gray, which is conventional coal. And so you can see as in this high CCS case, you're going to have a transition toward um, uh, basically um, uh, a tan color, which is, uh, which is fossil generation with CCS, along with increasing shares of, of some other things. Uh, and, and it looks different in the different interconnections, and that's uh, for a very good reason, which is there are very different uh, resource bases, uh, transmission requirements, and costs that are associated with location. And so it's not one size fits all. There are uh, there are, are definitely sort of local considerations on what that case would be. Uh, if you go to the next slide, slide 50, um, you'll see that the, that the thing that's growing rapidly over time is the orange bar uh, as you go through the decades in each case, but it grows a lot less rapidly in the west 
than it does in the east. Um, that's sort of indicated by the fact that the um, the existing um, uh, construction uh, and and uh, and applications for permits for nuclear plants are predominantly located in the east, indeed, and in, uh, largely in the southeast, some in the Midwest. But but uh, this again shows sort of the the regional preferences that are embedded in an overall. Um, uh, uh, nuclear development case. And again, uh, slide 51 um, shows the uh, sort of uh, similar differences, but the same overall trend and in the increase in the, in the, in the uh, royal blue and the gold-colored bars, which are the wind and the solar. There's also the gray-blue uh, offshore wind in the case of the eastern U.S., not really um, something that would be uh, viable in Texas or uh, not needed in, in, in the western U.S. where, where there's still very great um, onshore wind resources. Uh, and then finally the mixed case uh, in slide 52 uh, where you see uh, all of the low carbon uh, sources uh, growing, uh, although not the same in all the interconnections. So Ryan, again, if you would just walk us back and forth one time so we get, we, we get the eye candy of seeing how these different generation mixes uh, change over time. Um, and I think this, uh, among other things, should convey the um, uh, the challenge of of a sustained transition um, that's required in order to to achieve the infrastructure transformation um, uh, consistent with two degrees or less. On the balancing uh, side of things, slide 54. Um, this shows a. Um, for the for the western interconnection in a week in March in the year 2050, uh, the upper strip shows hourly uh, generation mix, um, uh, and this is a, um, a high renewable case. And so you see those uh, sort of bright yellow um, solar uh, peaks, and then you see the gray uh, wind, um, and then there are other components. And what you see on the bottom uh, strip is the counterpart on the demand side. And the point that we want to make here is if you look at the sort of the, the fingernails that are sticking up, which are sort of the daily peaks in demand, that um, what we have in these uh, sort of aqua or light blue colors on this lower strip, it, a lot of that consists of flexible demand. That is to say, um, if you look on the upper strip, you'll see sort of above the fingernail some, some light red or red-brown color. That's curtailment of, uh, of excess uh, generation at those times and those hours. If, if you didn't have um, flexible sources of electricity demand that were soaking up that generation, you'd basically be building a system that would uh, overgenerate excessively and be extremely costly. Uh, so down on the bottom strip uh, with those sort of uh, uh, light blue, uh, dark blue, et cetera, thumbnails, you see things like hydrogen electrolysis, uh, synthetic natural gas production, electric vehicle charging, flexible industrial loads, and so forth that are being operated in a way that's consistent with the generation side uh, of the picture. Uh, slide 55. Um, this uh, actually shows the same week uh, in 2050, 2030, 2015. It's a week in March. These are hourly um, generation uh, profiles uh, for each of the the four low carbon cases plus the the reference case based on uh, the annual energy outlook, um, and uh, and it shows for three different time periods: 2015, 2030, 2050. Uh, in each of the three interconnects, eastern, uh, Texas, and western. And so this is a uh, sort of a very detailed hourly representation of those generation mixes that. Uh, that we showed earlier. 
and this is complemented by a, um, a picture on the demand side, um, slide 56. Um, which shows, um, uh, again, if you look at the bluish colors over the gr the gray, you might consider to be the inflexible demand or the or the, the native demand as we uh, experience it now. And then the the other colored stuff is all flexible demand that has been uh, uh, added to the system to soak up excess generation to balance the system reliably and also to provide uh, benefits on the overall system cost. Uh, uh, when you need a low carbon fuel, such as hydrogen for other applications, and you have uh, generation sources that are essentially uh, very low or zero marginal cost um, in terms of their operating costs, then you have a potential very important uh, marriage that can um, greatly reduce the overall system cost of a decarbonized electricity supply and demand system. Uh, next slide. On the fuel side, slide 58, again, you would see this same transition if you went back to the, um, the, the figure with the, with the nine sub-figures in them for the mixed case. But what you see is uh, uh, the natural gas pipeline is carrying energy that over time uh, uh, has a greatly reduced share of uh, fossil natural gas, a greatly increased share of uh, biomass related fuel. Slide 59. And then, um, then you see that there are very different strategies for the natural gas uh, uh, pipeline. Um, for the different cases. The reference case, of course, on the left-hand side, uh, natural gas is natural gas, and that's what's in the long-term forecast of the DOE. But the other uh, scenarios all have some uh, proportion of, uh, of, um, of either uh, uh, biogas or hydrogen, or the red is power to gas. That's also known as synthetic natural gas. And one thing to note here is that the highest proportion in the low carbon cases is um, for the high um, CCS case. Uh, and you'll see that the diamond uh, showing the emissions density is highest there. The reason for that is, in the high CCS case, it's assumed that um, larger industrial users, for example, will have the opportunity to capture the CO2 from their uh, from their smokestacks, essentially, so that you can get away with using fossil gas and capture most of the effluent. Uh, since uh, the other cases don't assume uh, industrial CCS, uh, then you don't have that option. And if you're going to use gas fuels, then you need to decarbonize it mostly or completely. Slide 60. Uh, and this shows uh, a similar diagram for uh, liquid fuel supply and demand in the mixed case, um, where uh, first of all you see uh, the effects of electrification and efficiency increases in the overall reduction of liquid fuel demand, uh, and uh, which is still dominated by transportation. But you also see um, the increased share of um, of non-fossil um, uh, components. Um, slide 61. This again shows different scenarios that are possible and consistent with, with, um, uh, with the different overall designs of the system um, in the different cases. You can see that in the mixed and high renewables cases, um, uh, there's still a, um, uh, the diamonds are showing still a, a high uh, emissions intensity per unit of energy. However, you have greatly reduced the overall amount of that energy that's needed. Uh, slide 62. On the demand side, we'll start with transportation. And so this shows a transition in light duty vehicle stock in the mix case. Um, the, the, the sort of the brownish gold is uh, conventional internal combustion engines and light duty vehicles. Um, and then the red is uh, diesels. And then what you see uh, is a transition in the stock that really begins to take hold in about 
uh, 10 to 15 years, uh, and, and by 2040, the stock being dominated by um, uh, battery vehicles, um, fuel cell vehicles, and, and hybrids. Slide 64. Uh, and then these are the different strategies in the LDV case. Uh, what all of them have in common, if you look at the right-hand scale, all of them have uh, fleet average uh, fuel economies that are uh, equivalent to over 100 miles per gallon um, relative to the reference case, which is uh, only at about 40 miles per gallon. But it's achieved through different strategies, greater or lesser amounts of electrification or fuel cells. Slide 65. Uh, and this uh, uh, illustration uh, shows the how this transition um, actually works through how you can sort of conceive of the um, sort of the counting things to counting tons aspect, if you will. Uh, if you look at the topmost row, it shows the uh, demand over time. That's vehicle miles traveled, and so that's from the annual energy outlook. It shows it's increasing sort of with population over time. Uh, the second uh, row shows the new vehicle stock. Um, you see that even in the 20s, in order to achieve this scenario, we would actually have to have a transition of the stock that was really um, starting to happen in that time frame. And that's because in the third row, there's going to be a time lag uh, of about a decade between uh, when consumers um, start to buy these and replace existing ICE vehicles um, uh, and the time that it actually appears in the stock. There's always going to be uh, such a, uh, a time, time lag. Um, and then uh, in, the, uh, in the fourth row, you see um, the, uh, the fuel that's basically being used uh, to provide the energy service, which is the vehicle miles traveled, and that's going to essentially parallel what you see in the vehicle stock transition uh, by by 2040 in this uh, scenario. Most uh, light-duty vehicle miles are being driven on hydrogen or on electricity. Uh, then the next um, the next um, uh, row shows the energy use, and so. Uh, you can see by the uh, by mid-century um, they're sort of roughly evenly divided um, the energy use between hydrogen electricity and the residual gasoline but the overall amount of energy use is much lower because the efficiency of the vehicles is much higher again uh, largely due to having electric drivetrains and then finally you get to the emissions themselves uh, and so the residual emissions by mid-century are from the residual uh, uh, fossil fuel use almost entirely. The electricity is so low carbon that it uh, is reduced to really a de minimis share at that period of time. And so this is illustrative of the transition from, um, from um, a, uh, 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 a um, tons, counting tons perspective to a uh, counting things perspective. In fact, it works, it works backwards, but this is an illustration of what I meant by that. Um, uh, next slide, and this shows a similar transition for, for HDVs. Now, I'm uh, cognizant that we have just reached um, uh, uh, the 80 minute point uh, in the presentation, and that was when I uh, promise to take Q and A, um, uh, and so uh, let's let's stop here for a, a, a period of time, and uh, depending on how the Q and A goes, uh, if there is some time and people want to remain on the line, then I will show some of the uh, remaining slides. Of course, these slides are available to everyone. Um, uh, and I may also triage and just point out a, a few of those slides, but let's see where we go. So um, let's let's open it up now for a little while for questions, um, um, uh, and let's see what's on the um, uh, on the uh, sort of the uh, agenda here for resolution. Ben, um, you've been following questions that people have raised. Is there is there anything that you would like to um, to comment on so far?
Uh, yeah, there's just there have been a couple of questions about the the role of energy efficiency um, in the analysis. So um, probably either you should speak to that or I should speak to that. Why don't you, Ben? Sure. Um, we we've probably focused a lot on the supply side because that's that's the source of a lot of the differences between our cases. Um, but energy efficiency is employed. Um, very significantly in, in buildings, in industry, and as Jim was just illustrating in, in transportation. So um, we grow the economy significantly. Our energy service demands continue apace. Um, our population goes up to 440 million, and we still reduce final energy use in the economy. So that's um, we are employing significant amount, amounts of energy efficiency, whether that's light bulbs, whether that's heat pump water heaters, um, what have you. That that is being deployed even if we haven't paid quite as much attention to it in, in this presentation. Yeah, um, Ryan, could you go to the slide sorter view? Uh, and then move down to the somewhere in the 60s under the buildings end use. Yeah, and um, yeah, up a little bit. So let's look at slide 72. So um, this shows three key metrics for residential energy intensity, which is the amount of energy uh, uh, per, uh, let's, uh, here the metric is amount of energy per square foot for providing the service. And so um, what you can see is the, the current state, the 2014 energy intensity, and then in the low carbon case, uh, in 2050 what it is. And so this uh, basically is a measure of the um, technological energy efficiency improvement in the infrastructure. And so uh, what you see uh, in terms of space heating, the, the grayed out or silvered out anyway, the sort of the ghost bar is the reduction uh, relative to, uh, to the current level. And so you can see that um, that um, these services are being provided um, for these critical residential uses, space heating, water heating, and lighting, um, uh, that, that, that in the uh, intensity reduction is on the order of three or four relative to current. Um, and that there are particular things that you can point to. Uh, and I'll, I'll take this opportunity to say, that the, the electrification also has energy efficiency benefits uh, due to the thermodynamics uh, in certain critical applications related to our energy economy. That is that um, electric motors uh, are more efficient than internal combustion engines and electric heat pumps for both uh, water and space heating are uh, substantially uh, more efficient than, than their fossil counterparts. And so a considerable part of this efficiency improvement that you see uh, for the space and water heating is from the transition from uh, a fossil dominated system to an electric dominated system. Uh, and then in the case of lighting, what you're seeing essentially is the dominance of, 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 uh, of LED bulbs. Uh, and if you went to slide 74, um, then you would see uh, a very similar thing uh, in, the, in the commercial um, sector. Um, so, okay, uh, Ben, uh, back to you. Are there other, um, other questions that we should address? Sure. I was uh, feverishly typing a response, but maybe it would be quicker to um, just speak to it. Um, Wendy asked about um, the sort of how realistic is the high CCS case given the high cost of capture and sequestration and the current plan of many coal plants um, to close. Um, I think despite our cases sort of being presented on an equal uh, basis, I think we, we might handicap the likelihood of any single one as quite different than than equal. Uh, I think the, the sort of 
commercial development of CCS um, is obviously a significant hindrance in, in the high CCS um, case. Um, and again, as, as things are actually changing quite rapidly in the field of 2050 analysis, and, and in the last couple of years, sort of the, the bankruptcy of the coal industry um, and the price of natural gas has really made sort of the maintenance of that coal fleet by any means potentially not as attractive um, in addition to, to uh, air pollution regulation. So um, it's possible that sort of market forces, even near-term market forces that we're seeing now um, mean that focusing the priority on, on carbon capture and sequestration to, to maintain that coal fleet doesn't make sense. Um, and, and as we're developing new cases, we're actually rethinking that, whether, whether really keeping that much coal on um, is, is, should be a priority sort of economically in, in those cases. But there are a lot of coal fleets that, that have significant amounts of useful economic life left. Um, and so it's possible that, that those are targets for CCS. Um, right. And I would just add that, again, the, the premise of this is a what-if exercise. What would it take to go a certain direction toward the deep decarbonization objective? And uh, we're not really uh, handicapping one over the other. We're trying to show what the implications are. So um, um, that uh, Ben's comment, which represents my position as well, is sort of with our prognosticator hat on, but that isn't really the focus of the research. Um, Alex's question, have you taken into account electric transmission grid expansion needs with the different cases? Also when considering a high renewable scenario, are you focusing on utility scale renewables, distributed renewables or both, and transmission needs associated with each option? Um, Ryan, would you like to address this one? Uh, sure, Jim. So. Uh, uh, I guess in, in answer to the first part, yes, uh, we do have um, kind of values built into these cases to reflect transmission needs associated with, uh, with in particular, high renewables, which often are, uh, you know, generated far from, from the location of, of consumption. Um, so that, that is something that's reflected uh, in the grand scheme of things, of, of kind of costs, uh, looking at infrastructure out to 2050, that tends to be a relatively minor uh, piece of it, just kind of a, a note, but we, we do have it in the model. Um, as far as the question about, uh, about transmission level versus distribution, um, we, most of our cases uh, right now are uh, a mix of transmission and distribution, and we're not we haven't drawn a, you know, as, as stark a distinction between the two in the way that they operate um, or, or the different implications for the system as, as some, some other research might, uh, might highlight. Uh, most of our modeling is from the bulk power system level. And from that perspective, uh, you know, a, a distribution connected solar farm or a transmission connected solar farm, you see different transmission losses going to the bulk power system, but the fundamental fundamental balancing challenge is, is somewhat similar, uh, you know, regardless of location. So um, this is something in our new model that we are actually hoping to explore more because we were able to get more resolution on the distribution grids. So I think in, in uh, you know, in, in probably four or five months' time, we might have more to say on that particular question. Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit as well. We do, we have a mix of, of bulk connected renewables and distribution connected renewables. Our distribution connected renewables do reduce the need for distribution infrastructure and transmission infrastructure. Um, the, where the rubber meets the road really in a lot of our cases, however, is the balancing question. Um, and the way we are imagining a lot of our balancing solutions, they are um, large scale, for example, large scale grid electrolysis. Um, and we're imagining that on the bulk system. So there is some value in sort of keeping those at the same level. I don't know that we would sort of conclusively say that tilts the balance towards um, bulk renewables, but there is some logic behind that, that the balancing challenge eventually becomes 
was so significant that solving it um, really you want to be utilizing the whole grid and the diversity of the whole grid, which means a lot of flow um, sort of between regions um, and even flow distribution to transmission. Um, but yeah, and let me let me add to that that. Um, um, uh, Jimmy, Sorry, <laughs> Jimmy, you still there? <laughs> yeah, I, I the, had a had a little um, a little glitch here. Let, let's move on to the next question. Um, so Nathan asks, have you looked at the implications for particulate matter air pollution in your various uh, pathways? Um, so, uh, uh, well, Ben, why don't you go ahead and take that one off? Sure. Um, so interestingly, the origins of this model um, actually came out of California and it came out of Southern California and it came from um, Southern California Gas Company um, and they were interested in sort of the, air, the particulate emissions implications of some of these pathways um, and so that was actually the origin of the model. Um, as we've expanded to, to uh, the U.S. we haven't leverage that capability just because particulate pollution is so is such a local issue. Um, sort of back of the envelope and instinctually particulate um, pollutants go down incredibly. Not obviously very different in different scenarios and it may be one of the reasons why the CCS case is actually um, significantly less attractive um, is that you have if you have so much more just combustion, pure combustion, um, and so you have a lot more coal combustion. Uh, our primary uh, heavy-duty vehicle fuel remains diesel, uh, and so from a particular perspective, that, that's, that's uh, suboptimal, to say the least. Um, and so there are significant differences between cases. Our new model, we've actually built that capability in to sort of locate some of those uh, sources of particulate pollution and calculate that in um, But this particular analysis was not focused on it, but, but I think you definitely hit on a point that that it's not just CO2 in terms of the, the sort of outcomes of these energy systems that, as we develop them. So we've got another question here from, uh, from Lee um, asking, do these scenarios suggest the need for time-limited permits for new gas-fired uh, electricity generation um, so that uh, natural gas is not locked in for, for 30 or 40 years? Um, ben, Jim, you want to address yeah, that? I, I can speak to that. So um, the the framework that we have is that if you build it, you have to pay for it. So it, even if really what it comes down to is it becomes a capacity utilization problem. So as you could build a gas plant in 2020 and you're anticipating running it at maybe a 60% cap factor, as you bring renewables onto the system, that cap factor goes down, down, down. It's changing basically the role on the system. So what that get that unloaded gas capacity ends up actually doing in the long term is providing backup to that to those renewable resources. That's not free. We have to pay for that, but that is incorporated into the scenarios. Um, so really, it's a it's it's a transition within sort of the utilization of that fleet. Um, and and you are correct that you need to sort of think about the longer term implications for that because you know building a coal plant. Maybe you can run it a lot right now, but it doesn't have the same utility in a higher renewable scenario. We can't ramp, we can't sort of turn it on with the drop of a hat, um, ramp it quite the same way we can ramp gas. So um, it, it becomes a capacity utilization problem from a financial perspective, but we do, we are accounting for that. Yeah, and so I, I would just add that um, some people uh, have raised this question with regard to the clean power plan and the, the prospect of a coal to gas transition in the U.S. generation fleet, and they've asked the question, is that a dead end? And the answer is not necessarily, but it could be. Um, and the way that it could be is if there is simply replacement of coal with gas, and there's not a uh, complementary and par parallel build out of of truly low carbon sources uh, like renewables, uh, nuclear, or or CCS. Um, uh, if if there is a 
parallel build out, um, then gas plays this declining role over time as the carbon budget binds. Uh, and and it has to play a different um, sort of economic role, which probably means a change in wholesale market rules that would allow um, allow it to, to the the gas generation to recoup its cost on the basis of the uh, capacity or reliability that it provides or the flexibility. Um, uh, so it is it is possible to have more gas generation in a low carbon system, as, as Ben says, if you just don't run it very often. Um, and uh, uh, you can uh, definitely account for that in this kind of analysis. Um, Blake writes, I'm curious about the biomass projections being so low for the electricity sector. Is that because of concern over short-term carbon emissions, even if it becomes carbon neutral in the future? I'm thinking of electricity plants in England replacing coal-fired boilers with wood pellets from southern forest. Um, I'm going to give sort of a high-level response and let Ben res respond, I think, in a little more detail. But the uh, overall, um, once, you, once you accept the idea that biomass is a limited uh, resource, then you have to ask how is that best allocated. Um, and uh, of course, in the real world, there will probably be some economic allocation. It's hard to predict what that will be in the transition uh, to a low carbon system. It probably the markets and the prices probably will look very different from the way they do now, with with most of the allocations uh, basically being uh, to ethanol. Um, but um, uh, what we found from a carbon reduction perspective is that biomass is an extremely precious resource and you have a harder time um, meeting the carbon targets if you use biomass um, in some of the applications that are um, conventionally thought to be the likely ones and those two things are electricity generation and light duty vehicles. That is not where we uh, apply um, uh, biomass, with the exception of small amounts of uh, of biogas from from um, waste facilities that are located near power plants and so forth. But in general, uh, we apply uh, the precious biomass resource either to um, substitutes for 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 diesel and jet fuels or uh, for use in uh, industrial applications with with difficult um, uh, substitution patterns and so forth. Ben, do you want to add to that? Um, yeah, just the the logic of the system is one of substitution. You have a limited number of of decarbonized primary energy sources. You're you you have the most num you have the highest number of decarbonized energy sources in terms of producing electricity directly, um, and so to the logic is that those those sectors that are difficult to electrify are really the place you need to allocate biomass to, um, and so that is why we don't burn biomass in in power plants is because we can build wind turbines or we can build solar plants, um, and and then on the difficult sort of then uses to electrify we can apply that biomass. So that's the that's the inherent logic of that of that choice. Yeah. And similarly, in transportation, we have a better choice in, 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 in electric vehicles or in fuel cell vehicles. We don't need to use our sort of valuable biomass resource for those. We have other alternatives. Additional questions? If there's no additional questions for now, I think I'll, as long as we have an audience in 20 minutes remaining, I think I'll go ahead with the uh, with the slides. Uh, Ryan, could you go to slide sorter view? Um, yeah, and um, let's uh, let I want to make sure that we get to um, uh, so the sort of the final set of results. 
uh, on policy challenges, and then we can come back to some of the more detailed results if we have time. So slide 95. Um, that this is our um, sort of uh, view on what is needed from policymakers given the findings of our report. And so please take this with a, with a grain of salt, but this is our perspective. Uh, the, the, the first thing that we would say is it's really critical to identify what policy needs to accomplish before putting forward a policy a priori. We, we, we see this over and over again. We operate in the sort of sausage factory of actual sort of policy and decision making. And we see see many uh, people coming forward with policy suggestions and, and, and policy mechanisms uh, before they really uh, know what it needs to achieve. Uh, I think we need, um, as a sort of policy culture, to do a better job of anticipating future choices. Um, but we don't have a crystal ball, and this isn't prescriptive, and it isn't a forecast, but it is definitely a charting of the envelope of possibilities. Uh, you can say where you need to get to in terms of, say, the energy emissions uh, intensity of electricity or of pipeline gas or whatever by a certain point in time. How you achieve it, there's a great deal of optionality still. The market will decide, policies will decide, but we can uh, anticipate choices and forks in the road. Uh, and and we will need to both have a plan and have a business model. This, the the level of coordination that is required to achieve this system level transformation uh, cannot be um, cannot be accomplished independently by uh, only government action or by only the the sort of the action of the markets. But in fact, both. And and for the market to act, there needs to be. Uh, a business model that will work for the different participants. Um, so slide 96, uh, these are some examples of what we consider to be um, the, the greatest overall policy challenges. Uh, and these are not necessarily connected to um, specific short-term choices and policies at the federal level, at the state level, at any level, but rather this is what the requirements of the transition are. So. Uh, how do you create a suitable environment for large-scale sustained investment on the order of several tens of trillions of dollars uh, over, over the next um, 35 years or so? Slide 97. Um, and uh, very closely related to the idea of, of uh, sort of lengthy like lifetimes of uh, the most important kinds of equipment in the energy system. Uh, how do you incorporate future carbon consequences in current purchasing decisions? I said earlier that you don't have to do early retirement in the United States, but you do have to do timely replacement. This is essentially the uh, the reframing of that. Uh, if you don't take uh, the consequences of uh, of investing in a in a, a, a long-lived uh, piece of infrastructure. Uh, into account, then uh, then you'll get it wrong. You'll either have to retire it early, or you won't make your emissions goals. Um, uh, slide 98. Um, we looked at this earlier in terms of the uh, light duty vehicle transition. Um, the the lower um, uh, chart shows the the vehicle stocks, and you see the again the dominance of the alternative vehicles. Uh, considerably far out, 25 years from now, approximately, when they really start to dominate in the system, 20 or, 20 or 25. But much earlier, you need to uh, see a sort of rapid consumer adoption. We don't live in a country where that uh, can be achieved uh, entirely by fiat. And therefore, there needs to be some kind of plan for, for how uh, the, 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 the market will make this transition and what, what sort of um, uh, policies uh, plus market development strategies are needed to get the um, the bulk of new car sales by 2030, which is much closer on the horizon, uh, be these alternative vehicles. Um, slide 99. Um, how to coordinate across sectors where the institutions don't now exist. This is a sort of a, 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 a direct result of our California work. I mentioned, alluded to this earlier as a fork in the road. But the transportation sector um, 
uh, vehicle manufacturers, uh, the, the, the government agencies that control transportation, transportation and so forth, really don't have a lot of sort of either market or uh, regulatory connections to the electricity sector. And yet, we're coming to this fork in the road where, uh, first of all, no matter what happens, electricity generation will have to increase because many things will have to be electrified. But you have an option for the light-duty vehicle fleet of either uh, using fuel cells or battery electric vehicles. If it is, um, if it is fuel cells, um, then uh, uh, a substantial amount of flexible grid hydrolysis, in the case of California, about 9,000 megawatts is required, and hydrogen fuel, fueling stations. Um, whereas if, uh, if there are no, uh, if there, there's not much in the way of uptake of fuel cell vehicles and you're focusing on battery electric vehicles, then uh, there is a much higher electric vehicle charging load and um, substantial new energy storage is required and you're not building uh, uh, electrolysis and hydrogen fueling stations. Those are uh, both uh, sort of outcomes that are dependent on long-term investments in planning. And so a question for people thinking through the policy um, horizons uh, is, is how you go about creating um, coordination mechanisms uh, across sectors where it doesn't now exist. Slide 100. Uh, again, we referred to this earlier, showing the electricity and supply supply and demand sides um, out uh, in, in 2050. Um, and I alluded to the requirement uh, both uh, sort of for reliability and for overall economics of having a lot of um, flexible demand, such as hydrogen generation, vehicle charging, uh, industrial demand, and so forth, on the electricity system. Um, that means, um, again, these are long-term investments that need to be coordinated. If you build out all the solar that you see in these yellow sort of fingernails that are sticking out of these hourly generation charts on the top side, um, if, if the flexible generation uh, on the bottom strip is not there, then you're not going to have that outcome. Uh, and so again, these are areas that are not typically uh, coordinated in terms of regulation or investment. Uh, slide 101. Um, some people talk about the obsolescence of utilities, but what we show across our cases is there's actually a higher percentage of final energy delivered through networked suppliers, by which I mean the natural gas pipeline and the electricity grid in the low carbon cases than, than there is uh, at present. And so um, uh, what is a sustainable business model for those network suppliers? Um, slide 102. Um, all of our um, scenarios show a, a, a vast decrease in, um, in fossil fuel uh, consumption. Um, and um, tax revenues that are derived from that consumption uh, are going to go into a substantial decline. And so governments, some governments have actually already responded to that. There have been some cases where uh, there's been reluctance to um, uh, promote uh, electric vehicles because of the loss in, in, in different kinds of highway revenues. And so this is, this is maybe a, a, even a short-term issue. It's certainly a long-term issue. Slide 103. Um, uh, this is uh, somewhat related to the uh, how to coordinate across sectors that don't really talk to each other. But, um, but in, in not choosing winners, uh, there's an assumption that, that market competition is a, is a good thing and that we need to have sorts of competition among technologies and different solutions. That's certainly true. But we don't always know what is going to be competing. And some of our current assumptions about what those are aren't necessarily the case if you take the long-term transition uh, and into 
perspective. And so one a sort of very unintuitive outcome of that in our California work was that depending on uh, how you use biomass, you could have a big impact on, on, on strategies and building. Again, two sectors that have almost nothing to do each other, with each other currently. But if you end up using um, uh, biomass for, say, diesel for heavy duty uh, vehicles, then you have no choice in buildings to uh, replace uh, combustion emissions uh, than to heavily electrify it. It is possible, however, if you use the biomass in, uh, in a gasified form and put it into the pipeline, that a combination of, um, of uh, very high uh, building energy efficiency and uh, this lower carbon gas could get you where you need to go with building emissions. Uh, but right now, um, they're, they're, it's hard to imagine how these technologies actually compete, how you get market discovery when they operate in such different domains. Slide 104. Um, and then uh, we alluded to this a little bit uh, a, a while back, but um, there are some market design challenges for low carbon electricity systems. I think this is um, this is fascinating. Some of these are beginning to be glimpsed in in current uh, actions that are taken um, sort of at the FERC level and also at the state level and with the with the RTOs. But uh, these are the characteristics of a low carbon electricity system. Variable costs are at or near zero. And so since the cost in the electricity system are not related to fuel in a substantial way. Um, how do you allocate fixed costs, which are the real cost of the system, on a time-dependent basis in an economically rational way? Um, secondly, um, meeting net load, that is the, 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 the net of the load and the um, inflexible resources, such as wind and solar, inflexible in the sense that you don't know when they're coming or going, uh, that, that net load is now the new operating reality. And so how do you reflect the equivalent value of supply and demand side resources in meeting that net load, um, uh, a term that we've used is symmetrical market design. We definitely don't have a symmetrical market design right now in electricity. We have a paradigm where even with some demand response, uh, you basically supply a uh, a more or less inflexible demand. And that is not the way it is in that 2050 uh, strip of supply and demand figures where you see very, very large uh, penetrations of, of, uh, of flexible demand. And the market has to reflect that for that to work. And then uh, uh, I alluded to this earlier that supply and demand side procurement are closely linked. How would you send the signal to potential demand side developers? Um, for example, to avoid the premature building of integration solutions such as storage. Um, this is uh, was sort of implicit in what um, Ben and Ryan were, were saying earlier about, about balancing. That is, um, uh, in, in a lot of the current discourse, there's an assumption that the, the main uh, avenue toward, toward balancing in a highly renewable system in the future will be storage. Well, Storage is one of the solutions, but it is probably not the principal one from our standpoint. And also, uh, storage, depending on the kind, if we're talking about battery storage in particular, has a very particular sort of uh, technology characteristic that has a limited um, utility in, in terms of the amount of renewable penetration there is in the system. That is, if it's, if it's hourly to daily, then it can have a role if it becomes something where the imbalance between supply and demand is many days or even weeks. You need some other kind of solution. And so balancing actually has a, a, a much larger envelope of possibilities. And so that procurement needs to be linked. And really what we'd suggest is that uh, high net load factor uh, as opposed to traditional load factor uh, could become the new asset utilization paradigm for investors in there. So those are some of the policy um, policy questions that we we see at sort of the the, the macro scale, if you will. And um, and I guess the the thought is that 
these do need to be considered just like the sort of the technology options need to be considered in terms of the the long run um, investment decisions and so forth these policy considerations uh, should at least be thought about when looking at shorter term policies whether it's the renewable fuel standard or, or the cafe standards or um, um, RPS or um, clean power plan or whatever okay so we're uh, very close to uh, the end of our of our two-hour time slot. We've got uh, about four minutes left. Would anybody else um, like to raise a question? Jim, we've got one question here from uh, Uma uh, asking, uh, does this work incorporate energy storage as near commercial, quote unquote, in electricity cases for renewable energy along the lines of CCS element for fossil energy? Why don't we let Ben handle that one? Um, so this particular work did not incorporate large-scale deployment of batteries on the electricity grid. Um, that was a function of really being limited by public sources in terms of cost projections. Um, we, we, we sort of think they're going to be lower, and, and even in the last year, there's been momentum indicating that they, that they are lower. Um, so that's kind of one of those, those things that is, has evolved over the last year in terms of our thinking. But, but Jim is right that, that we don't think that the balancing sort of problem has a silver bullet, and we certainly don't think that silver bullet is, is batteries. We certainly don't think it's anything. We don't think there's a silver bullet. But um, we, in this particular case, because of our cost projections, didn't employ them because it, it, it raised the cost to use them. Um, so. Good. Are there any other questions? Um, so uh, I, I didn't go through a number of the slides. Um, and so uh, we welcome people to um, go through those and send us questions, um, uh, either on the slides we did cover in the presentation or the ones that we didn't. And the things that are behind the final slide in the presentation, um, uh, uh, the backup slides are also fair game. Um, uh, I would point out um, uh, uh, there's a small section in the backup slides on related areas of research that have sort of taken our pathways research as a basis. For example, uh, questions about the siting of renewable energy facilities. I think those are probably uh, of interest to, to, to some of you working in, in certain areas in your chapters, and so you might want to take a look at those. But uh, anyway, uh, for, for, for uh, Ryan and for Ben and myself, um, we appreciate your time, and we hope this has been helpful. And um, I, at least, will be um, in in New York for the authors' meeting uh, kickoff, and I enjoy. I uh, 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 look forward to um, to meeting many of you uh, there, and possibly uh, one or more of my colleagues will join me as well. But anyway, um, uh, thanks again, and uh, and uh, uh, look forward to. Um, um, a long collaboration and a successful outcome to this project. And many thanks to uh, Michael and to John for uh, bringing me in and for uh, allowing us to give this presentation. Great. Thank, thanks, Jim. That's, You're welcome, Ryan. Thank you very much. We will uh, shut down the presentation. Take care, everyone. <laughs>